Trav is Wayne Goodsell. So obviously I have to do comment reply video now. Robin, 99 year old Robin, is jealous of my crush with Nancy Drew. That can be the only explanation for the pages of comments. <laughs> I've dedicated three songs for you, and if you're thinking, no, it's only been two, it's because this one also <laughs> is all dedicated to you. Seems like you just need a good head rub to relieve all that stress and tension. <laughs> and so, as uh, comments will have false accusations against me, they'll have lies, hate comments, death threats. It's important to remind everybody about the the biblical story, parable of the beam and the moat. And nobody seems to understand it, but it has to do with making false accusations. That when you make a false accusation, you are revealing yourself. You are projecting what you yourself are guilty of. And in so doing, you it's a, like a Freudian slip of the brain. You're blaming other people for what you yourself are guilty of. And so if you go around slut-shaming other women, well, how old was that child when you got married? When was the baby born? <laughs> Stuff like that. And so, yes, I... I can see Robin, too. <laughs> Even though it has a basis in reality, when she goes off, there's some fun stuff that I would like to know more about Robin for. <laughs> Even though you are 99 years old. You've lived quite a, a wild life. So, uh, we're going to start with an email. And so I will not be revealing the identity. But uh, it's from a person who is among the few who are learning how to learn from me. And so... Hi, uh, there's some important information here that I would like to pass along with you guys. And it's kind of long, and so at one hour I will be stopping this video. And so uh, we probably only will get through maybe one page of Robin on those that were flagged by YouTube. <laughs> and so I'll have to do some some translating for you. <laughs> but this other email says your videos have really helped me a lot, especially in helping me become convinced that the church is corrupt and that Brigham Young corrupted the church, cooed the church. I'm very grateful for your contribution. I have stopped attending church and paying tithing. That is a pivotal move on your part. That is courage and bravery. Because I know the identity of this person this is a big step in your life. So I hope 
that you'll be okay. But yeah, this it's the right thing. Paying tithing is an extortion threat. It's the atonement paid back to Jesus. The scriptures, the Book of Mormon even, tells us that Jesus paid for us. And so that we don't have to pay him back. Even in the Bible, it talks about this. And they use parables to try to explain this. You know, the, the debtor who can't pay the debt. And so the, the, the guy, you know, punishes him, throws and locks him up for not paying the debt. And then he ends up being a debtor to somebody even more wealthier. And that's supposed to be God. And because he showed no mercy after his debts were uh, pardoned, he then got those debts applied back on and he got locked up. And the other guy got set free as a result. And so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that when the church uses Jesus to have you do something wrong or to believe in a manner in which you hate other people, you know there's got to be something wrong. Because especially when the church is saying that Jesus is a God of love and gives you agency, and yet what they're telling you to do and what they're telling you to believe is completely contrary. And so to be able to come to that cognitive recognition of what's really going on with this con of the church uh, is a pivotal moment in a person's life. And so, yeah, but not attending church. Yeah, lots of Mormons don't attend church. <laughs> That's no big deal. <laughs> the next step would be your uh, magic underwear, realizing that that they have no power over you to quote uh, Labyrinth what was your name? Jennifer Connolly talking to David Bowie and so yeah I, I uh, when I stopped attending church it was because of the bishop extorting me pull down your video on Adam fell that man might be and I can't do that. <laughs> Even use the prophets. You're going against the prophets. It's from the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and so, no, I can't go back to church anymore. And, uh, and then after some months, I then realized one morning as I was getting dressed, oh, yeah, garments. I don't need to wear them anymore. <laughs> and so uh, the first was to uh, stop wearing the tops. And uh, uh, then as my finances made it available, I then looked for Aaronic priesthood wear, as I mentioned in the previous video. And so, yeah, the, this is... This is the hinge pointing in your life. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. And then coming out to others who will notice that you're missing. And the bishop will notice that you're not paying tithing anymore. And uh, your work, as uh, I'm sure there are probably lots of Mormons involved with your work. So that's a big deal that you're involved in here. So just remember, he caved during his pivotal moment. The church threatened him and he caved. So you're 
on the brink of about to be faced with that similar threat by the church. Whether it's directly from the church, whether it's through your co-workers and friends, whether it's from family, whether it's from your ward, it's coming. I too had been through it. And I was the victim. The bishop lied to the other members. So this has caused a great deal of difficulty between me and my wife. Well, yep. Family. Who still believes the church. Church's lies. She has not divorced me. But there has been a lot of strife. Because I no longer believe. And accept the church. Yeah. See for me I was already in the transition process of losing my second wife. And so it was easier of a transition because she was leaving. And so yeah, being in a marriage, you know, that's the tough one. And just remember, as Mormons growing up, We've all heard it. Members or converts to the church and the sacrifices they made to become a member of the church, having to give up family, friends, and religion. Yeah. Mormons tend to forget when it's a Mormon who's leaving them, <laughs> leaving the church. All of a sudden, it no longer applies. And so that's now what your wife is being faced with. Rather than wanting to communicate with you and understand why you no longer believe, she's going back into her bubble security blanket and lashing out at you when she should be lashing out at the church. So that is really tough. I feel bad that the church has led that the church has led to you being so alone. Yeah, I say a sixty-three. <laughs> you had you have had a hard life because of the influence of the church. Yeah. Yeah, before I even was threatened by the bishop, yeah, he knows. He's been with me long enough to know of 2008 when the, uh, the church, you know, retaliated. They had already destroyed my first marriage, turned my family against me, my parents' family and siblings family against me as well turn the bishop and thus the whole ward against me and uh, then the government through Mark Shirtliff began coming after me and uh, and so in order to defend myself I was forced to follow the First Amendment petition the government for a redress of grievances and I was tortured disappeared, attempted to murder me. My dad proceeded to erase my history. The church erased my history. The Deseret News erased my history. Everything was getting erased of me so that there would be no record of me whatsoever. And it was a miracle I got out, but yeah. I did not cave. I did not beg for mercy to be taken back and submit to the church's bondage. And because I didn't submit, my life was destroyed. He got his life back because he caved to the terrorist demands. I did not cave and lost everyone and everything. 
church still to this day still keeps coming after me. They will not stop. And I cannot stop. Because Mormons need to be rescued. And it's sad that Mormons choose to be evil and destroy their families, destroy their friendships, destroy their community, destroy their nation, all to perpetuate the lie that the church is pushing. Uh, he says, I also accept that there is a mortal person, Christ or anointed one, that God uses to help his people in the last days, because the role of that person is described in the scriptures, e.g. in Isaiah and 3 Nephi chapters 16 and 20, and many others that I brought out in my videos. That's the learning of the Jews. That in and of itself destroys the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints cannot be true if it's going to continue to maintain that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of its religion. That Joseph Smith was Christian. As the founder. It automatically is wrong. Automatic. And it's the most complicated thing for people to come to grips with. Even critics can't understand it. They leave the church for other reasons. Not because the church claims to be Christian when they claim also that the Book of Mormon is their keystone and Joseph Smith is their founder. That is not just contradictory. That is racism to the core manifested openly. That everything and the church says, everything the church does is automatically a lie, false, deceptive, corrupt, criminal. We cannot trust this church for anything. Because these guys are educated men. They're experienced men. And having done the footnotes, I know they know what the scriptures are actually saying. Because they purposely will not footnote them correctly for you. I did the footnotes of Deuteronomy. I did the revision of Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19, and they rejected it. I did what they told me to do, and they rejected it. And instead, they kept it so that you believe instead that it's Jesus. That is pure hate to the core, manifested in the open. And Mormons see it as love. That's how twisted the church turns Mormons into. And so he has a number of questions about God, how, who God is, and how we relate to him. There are many doctrines in the Book of Mormon and the other scriptures. Doctrines could have been omitted or been much simpler, yet they are given and reinforced through the Book of Mormon and Bible. Why not have a shorter, simpler scripture? Less stories, less doctrine stated more clearly. All scripture are in the learning of the Jews, which means it's not literal history, which means the stories are not teaching doctrine, 
directly. You're supposed to understand the doctrine from the story. And so thus, you get a lot of authors. You therefore get a lot of different stories. And the harmony of the doctrine should help you understand, be understood from reading the stories. The structural pattern of the stories are parallel with all the others. And you need to understand that the Jewish authors are purposely prophesying of the latter days. And so we can't remove any of them. We need to keep adding. Anybody who has a prophecy about the latter days, we need to add in to our scriptures. They're not commandments for us to submit and obey as bondage. They are prophecies. And as I've been going over with you, the Book of Mormon even is correct in the learning of the Jews with its prophecies. But because Mormons have that Christian blinder on, they don't see any of the prophecies that I am giving you guys in my videos. And so, to make them simpler, that just requires true prophets leading the church. You know, when we went out on our missions, we had the missionary discussions that had simple sentences for each of the topics. We don't have that for the scriptures. The church instead pulls out scriptures for us to memorize as scripture masteries. And we don't know the actual context because the church alters the context with Christian interpretation. And so if we were to go back and read the scriptures in its full context, it no longer makes any sense to us because of the Christian interpretation. And so there's too many Mormons who just do the minimal and just memorize the scriptures. And those people, if they find my videos, will attack me by parroting those scriptures. And they don't understand what they just did. Right, Robin? <laughs> and, and so, more stories, more doctrine per se, but there is, there is no more doctrine or less doctrine. There is just the one doctrine. And so, more stories is not threatening because it's all the same doctrine. It doesn't change. The only thing that changes it is people's interpretation. And so, yeah, the clearly part, more clearly, yeah, that's up to the prophets to do, and they refuse to do it. And thus, they're false prophets. And so, I... If I knew now when I, when I started all this, yeah, I would have had YouTube designed a whole lot differently. I would have still maintained my website, and then the church wouldn't have shut it down the day after I filed a petition against the church <laughs> in the federal courts this time. But, uh, yeah, that, I hope that helps you, is that the stories need to be seen as prophecy, not as literal history. You'll get confused, and it won't make sense. And uh, the church loves to loosely define doctrine as uh, anybody who actually studies the whole scriptures is, is called diving into deep doctrine. No, it's not. There's no such thing as deep doctrine. And so, yeah, a lot of 
the errors of imposing Christianity results in the branches of further absurdity and falsehood that comes from that. And so as you are in this transition phase, you are going to recognize many more things that the church has lied to you about that you need to cut those branches off and get rid of it and burn them. <laughs> and uh, it, this is a, a tough transition period for you. And it seems like you're all by yourself and everybody's ganging up on you now. As your wife has already begun. And then wait till the bishop gets involved and, and uh, other Mormons in your life get involved. Okay, next. Why not just say that the scriptures are prophecies of the future instead of writing like they are history of actual people? It's like the Aesop's fables. People tell it in story form. And this helps people remember the stories that's why parables are given is because even though people may not understand the parable at first they understand what the parable is talking about because that's part of what their lives are involved with and so that helps if the people think about those parables and hopefully one day it will trigger the light bulb in their head to go oh Oh, I get it now. That's why. And so, uh, Hercules, the legendary journeys with Kevin Sorbo. I don't know if you've ever known about that show or if you watched it ever. It's uh, often called Babe Watch BC. But uh, it's about uh, taking the uh, classical... Uh, Myths, as scholars wrongly call them, they are prophecies too. And it's just told by a different culture and people. It's, again, Constantine's Christianity that turned them into literal history, turned all the gods into actual idols. Constantine really screwed things up for everybody. And so, if you'll notice, Zeus, in order to have Hercules as his son, had to come down to Earth from outer space, Mount Olympus, to a 14-year-old girl, mortal human girl, and raped her, and then abandoned her. And so Hercules, Legendary Journeys, you have Kevin Sorbo as Hercules, who uh, loves his mom dearly because she raised him without a dad. And so he's upset with Zeus for abandoning his mother and not being there for him as his son. Sound familiar? It should the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, by claiming Christianity, thus turning the scriptures all into literal history, and thus the Book of Mormon into literal history rather than the learning of the Jews, that Greek, Roman, because it's Hercule in Greek, and then Roman is Hercules, and so the show kind of merged the two together as Jupiter is actually for the Romans and uh, Zeus is for the Greeks. But uh, uh, both, those are prophecies of the latter days, just like in the Book of Mormon with the condescending Jesus part in Nephi's dream. Seeing the birth of the child after the manner of the flesh and so Nelson 
when he talks about Jesus, he's actually talking about Zeus as non-Trinitarian Christian. But nobody knows this. <laughs> and so, yes, the Mormon Heavenly Father comes from outer space to a 14-year-old girl who's now in the Roman period time and rapes her, produces Jesus and abandons the mother and abandons Mary. Jesus is Hercules. He's Kevin Zorbo. He could have played in Mel Gibson's movie about Jesus. But uh, uh, Kevin Sorbo goes on to do the Left Behind series movies and uh, some other Christian stuff. And so, yeah, that, that's all that is. The scriptures are stories so that even a child can understand. And yeah, Aesop's fables were very dark and gloomy, as are the scriptures. They're very sexually exploitive and graphic and, and violent, but they're prophecies. And as we're witnessing, all of that is happening, just as it was prophesied to happen. And so if you know your Book of Mormon about the latter days of the Nephites, yeah, you'd be trembling and fearing like I am for Mormons who just don't get it and refuse to get it. And even though it was brought out with the potential banning of the Book of Mormon for being porn, <laughs> Mormons still, they saved the Book of Mormon and now they're back into their fantasy world again. And so, yeah, it's very dangerous time we are in right now and for you to finally make that choice to hinge point away from the church at this particular time in the history of the world you will look back hopefully surviving and see the the pivotal move you made at this particular time uh, and so maybe we, well, we're only at 30 minutes. We still have another 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, Gileadi argues that they have an ancient and a future fulfillment, as shows there are 30 examples, like the Exodus. I still have not done a commentary review of that book, uh, like the Exodus. World conquest of Assyria, apostasy of God's people, etc. Are you just saying that they did not also have an earlier fulfillment? Uh, no, this is prophecy pattern that emerges. By, by telling stories, they have patterns that are connecting them to other stories. So the Book of Mormon, for example, I still have the series on my channel on the homepage. It's where I, an Exodus pattern is a consistent theme throughout the whole Book of Mormon. And so with the dis utter destruction of the Nephites, the utter destruction of the Jaredites, utter destructions of others, those are people who refuse to exodus and stayed behind and were utterly destroyed. That's the whole message of the Book of Mormon. That's the warning. That's Joseph Smith's warning in his Joseph Smith history, Second Vision. That's his warning in Doctrine and Covenants passages that should have been footnoted to the Joseph Smith history of verse 40. And uh, that whole second vision. And the church is purposely not footnoting this. We're not about feeling good, faith promoting, gospel's been restored church. That's the lie. 
we are a latter day church that destruction is going to come and in order to be saved we need to get to Zion and that's where we're at now as of last Friday the fulfillment of Joseph Smith's second vision date with Isaiah 63 I'm now trying to figure out videos to get enough people, preferably here in Utah, who will exodus with me, not leave me behind. <laughs> it's like the Home Alone series. Oops, we left the child behind. And then we're going to have to edit one of them that had Trump in it. <laughs> and so, I, yeah, I, this is my dilemma right now and struggle is how to get Mormon's attention for this final push before the final day of the latter days which we all know the date if we just knew what to look for in the learning of the Jews. And so, yeah, the, the Exodus story, that's why Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19 says, it's a man like Moses. So the Exodus story is a pattern for the prophecies of him. Not the supernatural stuff, just the regular normal human being stuff. That's why the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi chapter 3, talks about Joseph Smith coming. It's not literal history. It was his dad writing that. And it wasn't to focus on Joseph Smith. It was to sneak in the Latter-day Messiah, that he would come through Joseph Smith's church. And so, a big difference there. Uh, and so, yeah, none of it happened literal history-wise. Uh, there are signs in the heavens that they could see and they could foresee of when signs in the heavens would occur in the future. They knew astronomy, not astrology, astronomy, the science of astronomy. And uh, I have too many people who confuse the two of them as if they'd never taken astronomy in school before. And uh, I, the accuracy is just astounding. I mean, to know the solar eclipse on the 21st of August 2017 such that they designed their calendar for it. That just astounds me. When I first bought that ancient Egyptian calendar for 2017 and then looked at it, jaw just dropped. And so yeah, I'm I've got the whole collection as a result because of his his publications and he's not Christian he's just doing the Egyptian calendar getting it from Egyptian source documents and putting them in there this document indicates that this day for this day in the future would be this form of worship at the Egyptian temples on this day that's all it is and so he knows nothing about prophecy of the future or anything like that. He doesn't seem to indicate that he knows anything about the Bible. I don't see any kind of Christian Islamic bias in his work. And uh, he's actually an Italian. Luigi is his, name, is his first name. So, yeah, impressive work. And I'm waiting for next year's. It should be coming out soon. 
I'm really needing to get that because I already know the Jewish calendar for next year and it's already awesome. <laughs> so, alrighty. Uh, are you saying that none of the figures in the Book of Mormon and Bible actually existed as real people? No, they're all fictional characters. There is a basis of reality, you know, like movies and TV shows. They're fiction, but the author obviously got the idea from somewhere in his experience in life. And so when you have Nancy Drew, you know, obviously she came from somewhere. You know, a little girl who's inquisitive, wants to learn things, and, you know, the book publications came from the mind of the author of those books. And Hercules, likewise. The Greeks and the Romans told their stories in their language according to their understanding and their cultures and traditions. And so the Book of Mormon. Sidney Rigdon's the major author of the Book of Mormon. That's why he used the, the manuscript found of Saul, of, uh, Getting my names mixed up in my head. Uh, the guy who died. He finished the book, went to the print press, didn't have the money to pay for it, and so he left it with them. And since Sidney Rigdon was a frequenter at that Pittsburgh press, when he was living there, not at the same time as the other guy, and then, because uh, there are some people who get confused about the post office, they both utilize that post office, sure but not at the same time. But it's not a matter of Sidney Rigdon stealing it from the author. It had nothing to do with that. Sidney Rigdon just hung out at the print press because he has a library of books. Because of the fall he took when he was a younger man, his brother says he required the library to help him compose his sermons for church and uh, and so he obviously had made contact with the Smiths at some point in time so that when 9-11-1826 occurred uh, Joseph Smith Sr. then reached out to him for help to finish the publication of the book so that we can have it and uh, he was not affiliated with any of 9-11-1826. So he was the perfect guy. And so because he had that document that contained the names Nephi and Lehi who come from the Jerusalem area to the Americas, that was used as the template for which to base the Book of Mormon on and then put the stories in the template using the Jewish manner of prophesying of those patterns, the Exodus pattern, for example. That is for us. And I still have yet to do the Lehi's second leaving and probably should throw in the Zoramites who leave. Those are Exodus patterns as well and uh, are what we are now involved with. And so it looks like, yeah, we were at 45 minutes. Sorry, Robin, next one. I probably will spend the whole day on videos, I guess. We'll see. Um, where did I leave off? And so, yeah, no literal history. Just remove it from your mind. Don't think of any Bible story as literal history. Even the Chronicles and Kings, with the listing of kings, they can only be trusted as far as archaeology has confirmed of their existence. And it only goes back just prior to 700 BCE as as far as archaeologists can go. 
And so anything before that, you've got to be cautious of. Because this was written during the Roman period time. And that's why they can only go back so far. And then it becomes prophecies of the future. David and Solomon, prophecies of the future, not real people. David, for example, is a composite of the whole 18th dynasty of, of pharaohs of Egypt. The David Moses dynasty. The man like Moses to restore the kingdom of David. It's the 18th dynasty that the authors are prophesying needs to be restored. And they themselves were a restoration because of the Hyksos that ruled Egypt prior to. And so the Egyptians live their lives prophetically, purposely fulfilling the prophecies as a, a prophecy in and of themselves. And so when you do your research in Egyptian, yeah, they are, it is literal history, but they're also prophesying with the manner in which they live their lives. So there's a difference between scripture and the Egyptian history that way. <clears throat> and yes, understand that the names have baby name meanings. And those baby name meanings play out in the stories that they're involved in. Even the villains. And yes, even into the New Testament, written by Jews, not Christians, they're not real. And I see Christians desperately trying to stretch Josephus' words and other documents that they can find to prove that the Bible is literal history. But Constantine started it. And so they're pulling what's called an anachronism. They're going back on to the Jewish stories and making them literal history. That is, by definition, an anachronism. And uh, they're, they're ruining the text by doing that. And so John, yeah, that's, that's Dove. So John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and the dove appears along with Heavenly Father saying, Behold my son of Mary in whom I am well pleased. That's the Egyptian translation. Love is Mary. Peter is seer in Egyptian. So, no one understand that the author is specifically using the specific names to tell his story. Just like the Jews did in creating Star Wars. Jedi, that's the Jews. Judah. Uh, the Sith Lords, those are Set, the children of Set in the Old Testament, which comes from Set who murdered Osiris. The adversary is Sat uh, Satan in, uh, in Paleo Hebrew. S T N. And it means adversary, but it's referring to King Set of the Egyptians. Uh, how can the eternal justice of God be satisfied without an atonement? No, there was an atonement. Just don't think literal history. It wasn't Jesus. And so the Book of Mormon uses the Christianized wording, but then puts in the context the correction that needs to be made. And so, uh, charity is the pure love of Christ. Well, charity is the incorrect word used in the King James Version of the Bible. And so the authors made sure to have love put in the Book of Mormon so that we would go, oh, this is wrong in the Bible. 
So the Bible is only the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. <clears throat> so it's the same thing with the atonement. Uh, it's completely misunderstood because everybody thinks Christian with Jesus. And so again, go back to the learning of the Jews, and this is where the Torah, talking about the sacrificial offerings and the atonement by animals instead of a human. That's what you're supposed to understand. And thus, Jupiter, the planet, is in the sacrificial ram constellation. As he's retrograding right now until the final day next year on April 2024. The end of the latter days and hopefully the start of the millennium in Zion. And so that's what that's all talking about, the latter days. Everything they prophesy about for the latter days is contained within this time period we are living in right now, from 2017 to 2024, that space of time. And there's a whole volumes of prophecies that are parallel with each other and have differences all about what goes on for this time. And it's just incredibly overwhelming and awesome to see how accurate they were. And at the same time, how frustrating it is that I can't get Mormons to see it. Uh, someone must suffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but don't take it literal. To pay the debt. This is about getting to Zion. That you must understand that the great and abominable church's hold on you is keeping you from getting to Zion. And that by listening to the prophesied Christ, you will leave Babylon, section 133, that I touched on yesterday. And not just leave the church, but leave Utah, an exodus, a literal exodus, even though it's prophesied in a fictional prophetic story form. And so that's why I'm concerned with the time we have left, even though it's, again, being extended here. I just, when I first knew about 8 April 2024, I was going, oh, please don't make it go that long. I cannot survive. The church is hammering me hard. And so, yes, I was hoping for something before that so that... Zion could be at least have the foundations laid before 8 April. <sighs> and so after Friday, oh crap. <laughs> so, you know, that's all it is. Just section Isaiah 64 or 63. Isaiah 63. Uh, the way he got that divine body. No, that, no, no, no. His name is Sun God, Emmanuel, Amun, the Egyptian sun god at noonday. And so they have to portray him as a solar deity, which is his name. Not, he's not an actual solar deity. He doesn't appear on YouTube and anybody who watches his video go blind. <laughs> He's human, not a divine person. 
human. And those of you who have been watching, yeah, it's me. I am the fulfillment. Because the other who refuse to believe aren't going to listen this long. So I can be more open about it. And so, uh, yeah, I had to learn for myself that it was me. And the Friday thing, I just went by inspiration. The shirt just happened to be on the top of the pile when I wore it. That's what I was wearing that day. I just followed the inspiration and the results I now knew was a fulfillment of prophecy. And so I have to put off the falsehood that the church put on me as a little baby, just like the church did to Joseph Fielding Smith Sr., the son of Hiram Smith. Heber just trashed him. And that's what they were hoping that this church would then do is destroy me. Even though they really didn't believe I would come, but just in case, they did to Joseph Smith, Joseph Fielding Smith Sr., as they would do to me. And that's why the church has been more devastating in my life than other people who have come about. Avraham Gileadi they would have done damage to him too if he had chosen to trust the scriptures in the Book of Mormon and Joseph over the threats of the church. But uh, what they did to me, they wouldn't have done to him. I literally fulfilled the prophecies with what they did to me. Jesus getting locked up, tortured. Joseph of Egypt getting locked up, tortured, having dreams. Prophecies are getting fulfilled. And so I can't deny myself anymore. I tried. <laughs> but I can't. I am who I am, not just because of my name. I am witnessing the fulfillment of the latter days as I am a part of it. Just like Nelson is too. And so it's just a matter of getting to Zion. And so, yeah, the parallel. Brigham Young, Exodus, from Babylon, as he called it, the false accusation of the United States. When it was his Danites that caused the Mormon War, that caused the extermination order, that caused him to flee the country. And so they're calling the United States Babylon? No, false accusation. Beam and moat kicks in. And so, that same pattern is intended for the Exodus. But whether or not Mormons as a group will finally hear me, it's not looking like it. YouTube still has a stranglehold on my views. Mormons still are getting worse with their spiritual witness feelings as your wife is now demonstrating. And uh, and so I, I can't foresee at the moment, because of the wickedness of Mormons, being able to organize us into uh, groups of tens and fifties and hundreds or whatever, depending on how many people would be going. And that's why I was wondering, leading up to Friday, if that was going to be the day that shall burn as an oven. That uh, after it happens, survivors 
here in this valley would go, oh, I guess we go to Missouri now since this place is in ruins. And then on the journey, they think that Missouri is the place. And hopefully I survive and get to go with them. But I would be telling people the truth. And so once we got to Missouri, there will be Mormons who will want to stay and build Zion, as they suppose. Not knowing that that's not the place that Joseph designated. And so I would then be continuing on, and any believers on to the actual Zion, to build the real Zion. Because that will be the only place in peace, safety, or refuge. I have been given the whole blueprints to build Zion. And I'm not just talking about the structure. I'm talking about the whole civilization. And so it's frustrating that I can't talk about that until I can get a sufficient number of believers who can then be a part of building Zion. Because Zion is worthless without a Zion people. It's the Zion people that make up Zion. So, and then uh, the stories in the scriptures could have been fewer and less elaborate without a Jesus figure. No, he's me. Gotta have him. <laughs> uh, for example, why did Jesus in 3rd Nephi come and show he had been resurrected and state, no, that's the wounds in his hands and his feet. They're just telling it in a different story form. Zechariah talks about the wounds in his hands. That's the Jewish prophecy. Joseph Smith, in section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, adds feet. And I fulfilled that. And I'm still fulfilling it to this day. My feet are very sore from the pollution that we have here in Utah. Those are wounds that I got in my hands and in my feet. And they are in the, the house of my friends, who are supposed to be my friends. They are my religion, and they betrayed me. They are Judah. They are Judas, which is phonetically the same as Utah. Prophecy fulfilled. And so even the Book of Mormon in 3rd Nephi, 2023, Friday, Joseph Smith's second vision, verse 40. They didn't put in verses, <laughs> but it is amazing that with the addition of verses, how 2023 is the very same passage. <laughs> and so, yeah. The dying part, that's Aries right now. Jupiter is in Aries. He's being sacrificed. And here I am, all by myself, struggling to get Mormons to listen. All by myself. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. Having to struggle with the internet, hackers by the church, struggle with YouTube, attacking me and silencing me, and sending my brother after me after I freed myself from their latest prison at the shelter. All of this. Prophecies. My brother became part of prophecy. He doesn't know it. He was just threatened by the church to come after me. And so 
Uh, it's not a resurrected body because Jesus is not real. It's my body. I am human. I am the fulfillment. And so, uh, when Jesus says, I am not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill, that's what I've done. That's the Jewish Christ. And so, in a sense, I'm resurrected from the stories and prophecies. I am real. I am flesh. You can touch me. You can feel the wounds in my hands and in my feet. You probably have to rub lotion on my feet. The blisters have gone down after a few months. <laughs> but uh, yeah, went on to the mount. Mount Olympus. And there was blistered on my hands and my feet. And I'm still being blistered. Or, well, it's more open wounds on my feet. And actually, it's the heels, my Achilles heels. Once again, prophecies. And so that was Joseph's who added that. And so that is how it is a prophecy of the future Christ. And finally, how is his resurrection given without God's power to resurrect through Jesus? <laughs> Get rid of literal history. That just makes it confusing. I am the fulfillment. The word has become reality. And so I am him. I am the sun god. That is my name. I am the fulfiller of all the prophecies. And all Mormons have to do is get rid of Christianity. Use the learning of the Jews, and then they can see me. And then scream in panic. But yeah, Mormons don't expect me to be the fulfillment. Joseph Smith? Yeah, because he already happened. That's the difference. And so I am restoring Joseph Smith's religion. I am as Joseph Smith. But as Joseph Smith says, I am the Messiah, who is the man like Moses. Who is the man like Hercules? Who is the man like Jesus? I am the fulfillment. I am the restorer. And that's the sense of resurrection. And in the sense of, of the family unit, the father becomes the son, the son becomes the father. That's also a, a understanding of the resurrection principle. That through my seed, my children become as me. And that's the afterlife stories of the Egyptians. Is that Hor Osiris was murdered and Horus restores the throne, overthrowing Satan, his brother said, his uncle said, and then when he ascends to the throne, he rules the kingdom and righteousness, which is Zion, and then he dies as Osiris died, to be born again as his son to take over the throne again. And so the fathers become the same as the sons who grow up in life. That cycle of life, the human race. That's also part of that. And so, yeah, it's, I 
have to have a woman in order for Zion to work. And thus a child, at least a male heir. If not a whole bunch of little cute little babies. But, uh, yeah, like I said, we have to wait now. I have to do my part. And you're now faced with yours, because you've now stepped over that line now. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, are you going to keep going to be fully on that line, despite all the storms that are going to try to knock you down and threaten you to come back on hands and knees, begging, like Gileadi did? And so hopefully you're thinking about the immediate future of uh, how to protect yourself. So, alrighty, so this was just for you then. Alrighty, you're next, Robin. I promise. <laughs>